afternoon, everybody. You're most welcome to the IIEA webcam um, on the COVID crisis and gender equality. This event is sponsored by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. We are uh, very lucky this afternoon to have with us a very distinguished speaker, Evelyn Regner, Chair of the European Parliament Committee on Women's Rights and Gender Equality. You're very Good welcome. Afternoon. Hi. Good afternoon. Um, see, to the audience, you will be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. Uh, feel free to put your questions during the presentation and they will be taken up afterwards. Uh, everything is on the record um, and the event has also been live streamed on YouTube. Um, if you want to uh, follow on Twitter, then you use the hash line, uh, hash line at IIEA.ie. A short introduction to Evelyn. Evelyn is a member of the European Parliament since uh, 2009, and previous to that, she wor worked at the Austrian Trade Union Federation. Uh, she has had extensive experience in the Parliament and has been returned on three occasions in the elections. As she has served on a special committee on financial crimes, tax evasion and tax avoidance and is vice chair of the committee on legal affairs. Um, at the moment, uh, she is with us uh, of her expertise on the gender issues. And as I said earlier, she is the chair of the uh, committee on women's rights and gender equality. Evelyn, we're so looking forward to hearing from you. It's a very topical issue and over to you. So I uh, say, uh Excellent afternoon and thank you so much uh, for this invitation. It's an honor and it's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. I'm looking very much forward also to the exchange uh, and would like to start straight forward uh, with the following remark. There is no equality between men and women. There was, there never ever has been real equality between men and women since the beginning of mankind. And this word mankind already shows it. It's not human being uh, kind, it's mankind. So we are living still in a society where we haven't achieved equality concerning the rights of men and women. And if, even if the situation concerning the rights has been uh, very much approved in the previous decades, it is still the stereotypes that are present and right now we are living in a very special situation an unprecedented crisis something we didn't know we we, we don't know that what we uh what we have been confronted uh the previous months and uh insofar we see the COVID crisis sharpens deepens these inequalities that are already existing and therefore, the conclusion has to be, we have to work on making these equalities smaller. And so I'm coming straight forward to the work of the committee, where I have the honor to chair that, the Committee of Gender Equality and uh, Women's Rights in the European Parliament. Um, the COVID crisis showed from the beginning on Will the agenda, will the agenda of women's rights, women's rights are fundamental rights, be posted into the future? Right now we are talking about the most important things. We're talking of all those billions and billions, 750 billions we have decided uh, on Wednesday in the plenary, though we haven't decided it, the commission has presented it and we debated that, uh, to be invested in solving those problems of COVID. And will the women's, the equality agenda be postponed because this is soft material and we do that in the future? And the answer is no, exactly because of this situation, the inequalities are sharpened. My committee and my committee, uh, we um, are dealing with the gender equality strategy that had been presented at the beginning of March, more or less at the beginning of the COVID crisis. And the gender equality strategy I'm very lucky that it had been presented by the Commissioner Dali, put on the table measures that should be taken for the future, for the next, for this period. And now the big question is and was, will all those measures that are so necessary to overcome inequalities be postponed? 
and a clear answer. And therefore, I'm just focusing right now in the beginning, what are we doing in the, uh, in, in, in the committee? Uh, the answer is no. Just on the contrary, the commission at Dali, very committed, is going on with her work. The commission's uh, 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 system is working. Everybody is uh, digitally really quite uh, updated. So no reason to postpone, no reason to postpone what? The uh, strategy on violence against women that was and is always in topic and is uh, even popping up far more right now. The strategy concerning uh, having binding measures concerning the gender pay gap and the gender pension gap. So we need transparency measures. We need something in overcoming all those uh, uh, gaps that are existing for decades and decades and since uh, mankind is existing and of course also to do measures concerning um, uh, empowering women uh, to in the leadership so the uh, directive uh, on uh, uh, a gender uh, a gender balance on boards men and women uh, equally represented represented uh, in the economic sector so I mean of course also many other measures but this is the focus and the committee will go on with its work. That's very important because right now we are debating on the commission's work program for the next year. And uh, there was and is the danger is everything is overlapping, overlapped by the COVID crisis. And on top of that, we started with our work. That is uh, the very updated work that is right now with a special report on the COVID crisis, what is the, the COVID crisis and the impact on women. And they're also focusing on health, focusing on those uh, running and maintaining the system. So 75% of them are women, we know that. Uh, the socioeconomic effect, so women pushed back 50s, uh, picture uh, of uh, childcare and uh, running the household and doing telework and, and more or less put, uh, put into the back. So all those issues that are coming up right now will be taken on board. And of course, many others that I've mentioned right now. So the message is the work is going on. We don't let uh, push each other uh, into the corner. And I think that that is a very important uh, message. We are working also in a gender mainstream structure. So concerning the impacts, the particular impact of COVID on women as frontline workers, on women in the home, on gender-based and domestic uh, violence. I said that we are confronted with an unprecedented crisis. So uh, when inequalities are deepened, we also see violence is uh, going up. So we have so many figures from different countries concerning violence. What is happening at home? So we see the doors are closed, people are in their flats, and this is a big danger for democracy. And of course, it's a, a, a danger for the freedom uh, and the rights of women as well. Because what is happening if uh, a family being under stress, children have to be uh, at home, they're running around, uh, homeschooling has to be taken place. So when a situation uh, uh, appears that a society is under stress, of course, one can foresee that violence is going up. I heard today the actual figures from Spain, 61% going up. So uh, domestic violence is already a huge issue. So it's already in the past that we uh, have uh, uh, two thirds of the society having been uh, of the women having been confronted with uh, violence at home. So somehow we are not talk talking about a minority program. And now we're getting the figures. We know uh, in Italy, 75% uh, the helplines uh, were going up, then uh, they are already, then it is already in, in, in other situations, helplines of other countries from UK, we just heard once it's going up 180%. But I really have to say that figures are, uh, are that dif uh, are differing, so we get different uh, numbers because uh, all those uh, NGOs that are offering support are sometimes are also really lacking, and this is something we got to know, staff, personnel, because everybody is uh, under this special situation uh, of stress. Seven millions of unwanted pregnancies are estimated 
due to the corona crisis, also because in many countries, the access uh, to SRHR is restricted. We get information, this is something I didn't know so far, so it's quite new, that especially sex workers are strongly hit uh, by this and due to uh, many of them working in very unsafe and even in free conditions, they have been facing enormous repercussions. We learn that in Italy, Caritas is providing them with food and shelter because no one else is taking care. So those being at the edge of the society, those suffering often uh, of uh, a specific difficult situation are confronted in this situation even with more, uh, uh, with more uh, uh, difficulties than they uh, do anyway. And of course, we, the rising numbers uh, that are emerging right now uh, is not, are not happening only in Europe. Uh, the, uh, all this is happening worldwide. I was in contact with so many representatives in Malaysia, in Latin America, just uh, say in, 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 in the United States, so more or less all over the world, we are uh, confronted with a similar situation concerning uh, domestic violence and domestic uh, and, and uh, aggression and difficulties uh, for, for women uh, going up. So we know while it's mostly men who rule the world, who govern it, who lead it in enterprises and of course also in the governments, it's women who carry it. Women are making up uh, more than 75% of the workforce in jobs of systemic importance. I think everybody has seen the pictures, this clapping for those working uh, at the care of elderly people, uh, those working in the hospitals from doctors to nurses, those being in uh, the childcare sector, those being in the supermarkets, those being in those uh, areas that are really important for maintaining and running the system. This is something we learned. And now we see, of course, also, these are exactly those sectors that have to be tackled when we are talking right now of the gender equality strategy and the gender pay and pension gap. In those sectors where we have a huge segregation, where we have this segregation where we see it's mostly women and it's mostly women in jobs that are really paid very low. So the question of minimum wage, the question of a pay rise is so important. In my home country in Austria, but also in Germany, I realized that there is already a sort of little revolution of all those women who say, it's very nice that you're applauding. It's very nice that you're giving us flowers. It's nice that the bells are ringing at eight o'clock in the evening, but we need support. We need a pay rise. And above all, when doing a description of the situation, those are uh, tackled most. Of course, it's single mothers because they are just having the full person portion. On the one side, there are those being at home who should do homeschooling and at the same time doing telework. And how can you do that? And of course, the, the, the uh, running the system, cooking and cleaning and so on. And then, of course, there are also those, as I mentioned before, uh, running, uh, maintaining the system who have to go out. And it's not the grandmother anymore who could take care of the children and the, uh, uh, and the care system is also in difficulty. So uh, here we have, and here we had really uh, difficult situations. I'll just give you one example, because as a trade unionist, I'm also very much in contact with uh, works councils and with those uh, really telling me uh, what's happening in the enterprises, bigger and smaller ones. Of course, we have those uh, being unemployed by, right now and uh, having been confronted with uh, insecurity, but also those uh, working in enterprises, they are still very well functioning and they are demanding the work of women. And many women said, no, I can't come to the job. I have to take holidays. I have to take uh, unpaid care. I have to whatever, because I have to stay at home and I have to do the homeschooling. And that those enterprises sometimes had been confronted with taking uh, 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 temporary agency workers. So somehow we really have women being confronted uh, uh, in, 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 uh, with very difficult situation uh, far more uh, than men. And what is happening as well, and this is something that is very important that we really would like to discuss with you uh, afterwards, uh, those stereotypes. Uh, we have right now different sets of situations that are taking place at home. Uh, I was uh, 
looking already at those studies that have been made and I'm very interested in those situations that are taking uh, place at home uh, because I was asked many times, but isn't it on the other time a chance that the situation is getting better when right now men are at home doing telework and women are at home doing telework? Isn't it something that men are learning oh god we should do also the schooling for the children and it's so much work with the home and somehow when you're getting used that you the both of them are at home that the situation is getting better and here i learned also from the observations of so many with whom i was in contact and i am in contact and also from the first studies i could see we have two different situations yes there's a little bit improvement in several uh, areas but then we see something else uh, as the, the uh, economists view sometimes that uh, you negotiate. Yeah? So if a woman is earning uh, more money than a man, so maybe they negotiate that the man is also doing more home value at home. But in many areas, it's not happening because it's not only the homo economicus that is acting, we have these stereotypes. So in many of these cases, I uh, got to know also from the first studies, it's women and men doing telework, even if uh, women earning more than men, or even if they are, uh, they are having the same salary, but nevertheless, automatically, women are doing more of the homework because it has always been taking place like this, and one doesn't reflect it. It's simply happening, it's simply happening. And I think with the, with the research work, we really need more data. We still need so many data that are lacking from violence and also concerning uh, data, concerning all of these figures, in order to have closer research work on what is happening here. So not only from the economic point of view, from the legal situation, but also from the sociology, from the psychology, because here really a lot has to be done. Otherwise, we find instead uh, uh, ourselves in the picture reality of women who are thrown back to the 50s cooking cleaning children and on top of that uh, uh, telework uh, if uh, uh, if this is a job a woman can do also concerning telework so what can be done and what has to be done the, the situation and that's right now my job as a, a politically important person we always looking on the solutions i start with violence violence uh, domestic violence is a situation that has to be tackled at once it is already tackled with many good examples. Why I say that right now, um, when uh, everybody is at home and the figures are rising and situation is taking place, we also have to act quickly. And we partly really acted quickly. The solution has to be unbureaucratic, pragmatic, quick, and really um, at a very low threshold so that women who are confronted with domestic violence really can also see whether it's the solution. First thing is, you are not alone. Many women are ashamed to tell that there is domestic violence. Campaigns can really help a lot. Portugal is a good example. The government uh, started very quickly with a campaign that this is something that is taking place many times, the same way uh, the Spanish government. So here, with campaigning, raising awareness, we can do a lot. The European Parliament itself, gave a good example. In the European Parliament, I mean, most parliamentarians are working right now from the home countries. There are some buildings that are more or less empty right now. And our president of the European Parliament gave a good example to say, let's offer shelter to those women who are kicked out from their parents who have, uh, no parents, from their, from their partner, ex-partner, who are in a difficult uh, situation. We give the hand we offer shelter. The canteen we have in the European Parliament was transformed into the canteen for uh, women uh, who are suffering of domestic violence. This helps 100 women, but on the other side, it's also a symbol. It should be a sign and a good example to so many other local governments, communities, and to uh, show you can do something uh, and uh, many others took this example as well. And I think that's something very good. We have in Belgium, in France, also in Germany, uh, empty hotels yeah, that were opened for uh, women who were looking for uh, shelter. 
And when you get something to know like this on TV, as a woman who is suffering, then you know there is a door where you can, that is open where you can go. And this can be also uh, something that is good for prevention. So there are many unconventional solutions. Also, the helplines that are offering help for women have to be and had to be supported financially. So some governments were more generous, others were less generous. We have really a couple of countries that are uh, acting uh, great. I'll give you a, one example as well. And I think these things should be always contagious um, that work quite well. Germany, in Germany, uh, we got to know from the minister, they just said it has to be at a low threshold because women who are suffering of domestic violence Sometimes they don't have a smartphone, the partner, ex-partner, whatever, uh, is taking it away from them. So how can they communicate? There are, uh, there are serious problems. So it was printed on the packages of milk in the supermarket. The supermarkets in this time, uh, one of the few places being open, you go there and milk is a, really a very a product, more or less everybody is buying. And we just have here the phone number of the helpline. Please go there. Uh, then... Uh, this uh, was really a good tool also com concerning the, the feedback we got so far. Other good examples, you go to the pharmacy uh, and say a keyword, COVID-19 mask in Spain, but also in Belgium. So there are and there were good low threshold measures. And other excellent example I got to know from Wales, that there is a special person responsible in the government for dealing with these issues and being the, uh, uh, the link between the authorities and the political government. So this is also something institutionally that works well. So there are many measures that can be taken and they are taken and they also uh, results, uh, show good results. But we see from several other countries, they simply ignore the problem. So we've just got from several Central and Eastern European countries that simply nothing is done, that the whole problem is put under the table. And this is sometimes exactly also those countries who say the Istanbul Convention, a convention of the European Council, that says there is a ban on violence against women should be ratified by all European countries. So that it's especially mostly those countries that don't want to ratify that and don't see any, any special uh, uh, explication with that, uh, that uh, those countries don't really do something. So concerning the measures, what can be done against domestic violence, very pragmatic, quick measures right now, but also in the middle and long run, measures of the legislator. That means the ratification of the Istanbul Convention and also measures um, in um, law at the European Union level so that there is a special criminal um, a spe a definition that it's a crime uh, by, to do violence against women. So we have to introduce that also in our, uh, in our criminal law. And this is something we are asking right now at the level of uh, the committee and the commissioner, of course, is also supporting very much our work. I uh, tackled the topic of violence. Of course, there have to be done many, many other things. We have to go on with legal binding measures, tackling the gender pay gap, the gender pension gap. I mentioned it before, it's part of the strategy uh, of the gender equality strategy. And we expect the commissioner to present a proposal at the end of November. And we're already preparing very carefully how and where uh, this uh, could be. Uh, the unpaid care work is an important issue. Women, it's mostly women who are doing this work that is not paid, but it is so important for maintaining, uh, to run the society. So educating uh, boys and girls can help as well. I talked about the gender stereotypes. This has to be uh, uh, an important uh, measure. And also this was turning up right now with COVID. What about the mental health? People suffer under isolation. We don't even know what's happened with the post-traumatic uh, uh, um, mental problems that will uh, uh, pop up. So this is also uh, uh, an important uh, issue. Trans people have to have uh, continued access to medical uh, treatment and abortions, hygiene products and protection has to be affordable and accessible 
for uh, every uh, woman. So you see, I'm just doing a parkour to so many issues that, uh, that will, uh, uh, will be dealt with in the next time. And above all, and uh, with this, uh, I would like to, to finish because I think there should be also uh, a lot be left for the debate afterwards. The Commission proposed the proposal uh, concerning the recovery fund last Wednesday, uh, so this Wednesday, so two days ago, 750 billion euro. This money has to be spent half for women, so half of it. There is a petition running where we say the whole principles of gender mainstreaming have to be applied when distributing this money. We have to say that more loudly because the Commission is obliged to uh, apply the principle of gender mainstreaming. But if we are not insisting on that, I just can assure you uh, there is so much blah, blah, and it's always said, but it's, uh, it has to be monitored. And it has to be monitored also on what's happening at the national level because there are really uh, several governments who ignore so many things. So when we're talking about women on boards, women in the leading positions, uh, there are simply no measures by several countries. They uh, simply ignored it. We realized in the crisis so far that countries that are run by female leaders, they do good, and this is not happening by chance. So uh, we uh, have to uh, be very much aware that the money is uh, spent in a gender-sensitive uh, way. This has to be done. And right now I'm also fighting and we are just looking how it can work also to set up a vertically a special women fund where specific measures should be um, uh, 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 done because there are several pro problems like domestic violence that is really, uh, first of all, a women's problem and there, there has to be more sensitivity. sensitivity. So uh, with these words, I would like to uh, conclude my uh, introductory remarks or into, in, introductory uh, overview of the activities we are focusing on uh, in the European Parliament and where we need as much as possible support from everywhere. So from all European Union's countries, from all parts of the society, from men, from women, from academia, where we expect uh, especially to support our work with a lot of data. We are still lacking uh, uh, data. The Gender Equality Institute is doing an excellent work, but we work, but we need more. Uh, and insofar, I'm looking very much forward to our uh, discussion we could ha uh, have right now. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for for that, Evelyn. Uh, I very much liked your idea of the contagion of good ideas and good practice. Um, it, it was, and it was very interesting to hear what was happening and what is happening in other countries. At the same time, it's very depressing that no one was surprised that um, there would be an increase in domestic violence as soon as we had a lockdown situation. And that that situation with domestic violence is as uh, prevalent in Wuhan as it is in parts of Africa, as it mm -hmm. is, and there is no difference. And that is really quite astonishing uh, to me. Can, can I ask you a, a question before we get into the debate? Uh, you seem to be very complimentary about the Commission uh, strategy for the next five years. Is there anything there that, uh, is there anything not there that you would like to see uh, included? Or is, is there anything there that you would particularly focus on improving? Yes, thank you very much that you, uh, that you raised this question. Um, the, our main commissioner uh, with whom we are working is Commissioner Dali, the commissioner responsible for uh, equality, so equality for men and women, but also LGBTIQ strategy, uh, Roma, so the most vulnerable people. We agree very much and have the same focus, so somehow I really can say there is an excellent cooperation. We always need uh, more uh, support from the member countries, that's what I have to say. But where I, and I think many of us would like to have more support is, and that's the commission, I think she wants it as well, but uh, she has to uh, work hard on that in the commission, is binding measures. Yeah, We are always fighting and having binding measures. It's very nice when we are going for, for example, when we talk about um, the, uh, the gender pay, the pension gap, yeah, 
we need systems where there are also monitoring and sanction systems in there. Uh, the, the, more, the more voluntary the whole thing is that will be proposed, I mean, it's not proposed yet, uh, the, the weaker it is. We, uh, in the, just two days ago, I heard by chance a presentation of um, a study from the Hans Böckler Stiftung in Germany. I was just driving my car, I listened to the news, and it, was, uh, it, was, it could be heard even in Belgium, who made an overview about um, uh, the representation of men and women and the top position of enterprises. And they made a comparison of the legal situation and, and, and how the facts are, and they said, those countries who have sanctions, those countries who have a legally effective systems where there are legal conclusions, when you don't follow the rules, there will happen something, there will be a sanction. Those have really the most uh, 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 balanced uh, leadership in enterprises. And this is Norway in, in, in this case, and then of course also uh, more other Nordic countries. And there was really a comparison you could see the more voluntary measures are, the less they are functioning. And when there is nothing, that there is also nothing. So if you would like to have more women in top position, if you would like to have more women in political leadership, you have to do something legally. You have to do sort of a quota. And the same is with if you want to eradicate the huge differences between uh, uh, between the salaries of men and women and the pension gap, then we have to do measures. If we don't do that, it won't come. It doesn't come because people are smiling and like women and are nice to them. No, it doesn't happen. So, and this is where, where we would like to have stronger measures from the commissioner. She uh, wants to present a proposal concerning the transparency of salaries. Transparency is always very important because if you see the salaries and make them transparent, who is earning what, what for, and where are the objective gaps. And if there is something that is not justified at all, it's an eye opener, but an eye opener is an eye opener. The conclusions have to be then, okay, we do measures that introduce systems of sanctions if, uh, the, uh, if the objective criteria are not followed. And here we want more. Um, thank you uh, for, for that response, uh, which I think is right on the button. Um, a question here from um, uh, Neve Fallon, who is a researcher at the Institute. Do you see opportunities there in the new areas of work or the new ways of working, uh, remote working? Um, and we already know in Ireland that uh, the um, pandemic has thrown up the issue of childcare. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you see that going at a European level? No, I mean, there is light, there is shadow. So uh, telework is, um, how should I say, it, couldn't, it, 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 it can be very nice hmm, at first sight, but uh, what I learned so far yeah, from the contact, from the data, from, from also from, from the exchange with uh, 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 different uh, women, it uh, can be a trap. Yeah? We have different uh, situations. You have the single mother, who is at home, who does the homeschooling, or who is suffering that there is not enough childcare. So childcare is a very important key in order to uh, overcome the pay gap, to overcome the teleworking uh, difficulties. So we see the situation of women trapped there doing telework that, should, uh, that looks nice, but doing homeschooling, and when they're doing the telework, when it's result-based at night, after having uh, uh, brought kids to bed or, I mean, it's always a question also of, uh, of the age of, uh, of children. So single, single mothers are in a specifically uh, difficult situation. Many of them have already uh, used all their holidays. So somehow they have the problem right now this summer, what to do with their children because when they don't have any more holidays. So somehow this is, this is difficult. The second, uh, the second danger I got to know is also, um, the danger of, um, um, of telework that is not registered when it's result-based. So many, many are working far longer and don't admit that they are working, that they're having far more working hours than, uh, uh, than they uh, obviously have. So somehow they say, I'm working four hours to, to reach this result on the computer and then it took them eight hours, for example. Third thing is, 
uh, not to be, it's getting more and more difficult to be organized and to tell the difficulties that are existing. So trade unions and works council are telling of the trouble, uh, that there are so many tr troubles popping up uh, and that there is a lack of exchange of communicating all these troubles. So there is a lot of danger. There are also good sides. Um, no uh, going to work, I mean, that you don't need the time to go to the office and to come back. So somehow there are, of course, uh, obviously and real advantages. And uh, what I see is also um, the problem of part-time work. So uh, telework could be maybe a positive feature, but can be uh, also a, a difficult feature. And then finally, we also have the problem of the situation. Um, we have to make a difference between the lower skilled and the higher skilled telework because it's always a question, can you organize yourself or are you organized from your employer? So can you, uh, uh, are you, are you the one who, are you the pilot? Are you the one who is, uh, who is, is directing the whole thing? Yes or not. So therefore I don't want to say there is only negative things, disadvantages, but there are quite many of them and we have to tackle them. So it, but it can be a solution for the future. And I'm quite sure, especially in the higher skilled sectors, it can be also a chance for women. And I underline three times for men to do more telework, to do it maybe twice a week and then to go three times a week to the office. And then also to take better part uh, uh, of the shared homework. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, two questions on violence. One is from David Joyce from the Irish Congress of Trade Unions, and he says it's good uh, to be a unionist in, in the role you are playing. And he asks whether you would agree that the early ratification of the new ILO Convention on Violence and Harassment in the, work, in the, in the world of work is part of the way forward. And a question then from uh, Mary Cross, who's an IIEA board member. Uh, and her question, again, it's about violence. This is a, a, a very, I think, yes. issue. Has the EU any leverage to get member states to strengthen legislation on violence against women? Strong legislation for police service to act is crucial. Mm -hmm. I really have to say thank you very much to, to both of them. Um, um, uh, I'm... I, I learned that. So I, I learned that, that the topic of violence against women is really a huge topic because it, is, it, it seemed to be so far that this is a topic uh, we didn't talk so much about that, but it is taking place and there are different levels of violence. It's not always uh, hitting, it's also uh, sort of psychological, uh, psychological terror. So there are different ways. Uh, of uh, suppression and uh, concerning the feedback I received so far, it is a huge topic. It is a huge topic and therefore I'm so grateful that we are talking about that, uh, about something that has been always put under the carpet and, 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 and put uh, uh, into the background. ILO Convention, uh, a, a clear answer, yes because it's not only a topic in the European Union, it's a topic worldwide. I learned that in many countries um, outside Europe, it's getting even stronger because of the huge informal sector. When you have a huge informal sector, uh, the, the pressure on women is even more. And my credo, my, uh, I could really say my motto as a chair of, uh, our committee is financial and economic independence is the key uh, of equality for women. It is the best defense, the best tool in order to avoid violence against women. And when a woman says, okay, I'm economically independent, then it's easier that she says, goodbye, partner. I don't rely on you. I go and take my kids or I kick you out. So there is another self-confidence. And therefore, we have to support women always, always in the economic uh, financial independence, above all, uh, or, uh, somehow also to look when we look at the pension uh, gap. So many elder women, they are still 
completely uh, exposed to, uh, to, to already for decades of subtle or even less subtle uh, violence. Uh, concerning uh, the, uh, the measures, yes, uh, at the European Union, there is, I mean, there, there is the, the Istanbul Convention, a convention from my point of view, every country should uh, ratify very quickly because it's a convention that isn't, from my point of view, very revolutionary. revolutionary. It's a ban on violence against women and that one should do uh, prevention measures and uh, that there is a responsibility of the governments to act on that. There are still eight member countries who don't want to ratify that. And the commissioner had indicated, and we support her very much, if it's not happening that the Istanbul Convention is ratified uh, in the next months, uh, the commission will uh, propose a strategy to tackle violence against women. And then we have rules at the European Union level. And we start to demand in order to be very precise uh, on a paragraph that should be introduced based on the Article 83 of the uh, EU Treaty, that um, that the uh, that, um, that 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 it's uh, that it's a crime. So somehow women's rights are fundamental rights, and it has to be introduced into then from the European Union's law into the national law. And when it's in the national law, the member states are really obliged uh, to to work on that. A couple of countries, I mean my country as well, uh, so the, the Minister of Justice had done improved the situation concerning, and this is the criminal law of the, uh, from every member country, and we can work on that also in the European Union's level, uh, that men who is attacking women, so many, many uh, countries have criminal uh, law rules in this regard, uh, can be forced by the police, the uh, the, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not finding the right way, way right now in English, that the police and the authorities can force the man to leave the home and to, that he has to keep a certain distance to the home in order to keep the women safe so uh, that he's not allowed to, to, to track her. And uh, this is something we can sharpen and can um, improve the work of the authorities to be better because in most cases the authorities are working too slowly. And women are sometimes waiting far too long that this measure is taken. And we've seen in Spain, Spain is a good example in this regard, that simply speeding up the obligation of the authority to react quickly saves lives of women, that it reduces even the number of killed women. So somehow it is really helpful for women. And it, I mean, we, I don't want always to talk about femicides, Violence is also very strong. Yes, is my answer. There will come up something from the Commission. Yes, we are uh, defining very precisely what can be done also in criminal law. And what is important, of course, then that the countries, when we do that, also implement it uh, in an effective way. And therefore, we are asking also for the proper monitoring uh, of, of the measures that will be done at the national level. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, the next question is from Claude Quain, who is an IIEA researcher, and she um, mentions that you discussed the role of the Commission and asks, how do interinstitutional dynamics affect gender equality legislation at EU level? Now, I noted myself that you've been quite critical about the way subsidiarity is used as an excuse for doing nothing. Mm -hmm. So if you could combine your response to Claude's question with the question I have for you, which is, mm -hmm. why is it taking so long? Um, why is there an opposition to membership of boards being more balanced than it is presently? <laughs> there is a quick answer. Sorry for putting yes. you on the spot. Uh, no, no, this is really, I mean, you know, you, you, you tackle really a very, I mean, this is something, oh God, I'm fighting so long for that. I mean, I can, I mean, um, when the proposal of, it was at that time, Vice President uh, Reding concerning an, a, 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 a proper balance, uh, uh, both representation of men and women came up. Uh, of course, we could explain very easily with legal arguments that there is a responsibility and that there is really 
uh, a legal base for this proposal. Why? For many years, uh, the Commission tried with voluntary measures, with CSR, with, I mean, all sorts of very nice things to raise the number of women on boards. It didn't work. It didn't work at all. You had a couple of enterprises who used it then as a marketing uh, strategy, and that's it. We realized uh, also that uh, those enterprises who have workers' participation work better because then, uh, at least at the board level, uh, the workers' representation side uh, is uh, sending uh, women, but this was really so slow that, I mean, we can really see, I mean, you know, I have a daughter that is 13 years old. I don't want to talk with her and she's telling me then when she will be, no, I don't know. Where, I mean, when she, she, she doesn't, young people are impatient. Why should they wait for another hundred years? Uh, we, we are coming up with that. So there is a clear legal base for, uh, for work at European level because uh, at the level of the member states, you can say nothing was happening. It was happening not enough in order to raise uh, the figures. And those countries who said, yes, they see their legal responsibility, they have to do something, they also had their results. It's very interesting to see that. So somehow, if you introduce objective criteria, if you introduce something that is treating men and women equally, and not uh, always overloading women with an obstacle, it's working. So why is this? I mean, I think we are here still, who are the leaders of uh, countries? Who are um, maybe following stereotypes? I can't oversee that. There are no objective criteria. There is no objective criteria. So it is not in the, in the uh, competence of the member states when they don't do the homework, the European Union has to do that. There is an added value. We have these uh, provisions in the European Union's treaty. When you look at Article Two and Three, when you look at the at the at the at the values, when we look at what we are uh, what we are obliged to do, when you look uh, uh, at the very clear provision uh, that there should be equal pay for equal and equally uh, worth uh, work. So we have all competences. I just can't explain that as it is so many times. These are the stereotypes that are still existing and therefore to tackle the stereotypes, those things that are invisible, that are existing in the society, but that we are even not aware uh, have to be overcome. And therefore I come back again, data. We need so many data. When we have data and they show there is no objective reason for, this, uh, for these inequalities. Uh, that's the best explanation uh, to, to, to work on that. I'm sorry that I can't be more precise. I'd love to get more arguments also from research. I really, when I looked at so many studies, I really draw my conclusion. Many things are based on stereotypes. Well, actually, the next question um, and probably it's, the, it's the next to last question, but uh, the next question is from Adrian Murphy, who uh, works at the National Tre Treasury Management Agency. And she asks, in countries returning to work and in dual working households, has there been any data gathered or is there data being gathered on who in that household is returning to the workplace? And no, I just I, I have to be very brief. I can't say that yet. It's too early because yeah. many countries are still uh, in the full confinement. So some, uh, my home country, Austria, just starts slowly. But what we see, um, that there is a big interconnection between um, schools opening and schools not opening. So uh, when the schools are not opening, so it's women staying at home. That's what we see so far from Austria. I have been in contact with many uh, um, uh, teachers and those running um, uh, the directors of schools. And they uh, told me um, there is a huge, and again, we are uh, talking about something that uh, hasn't only to do with figures, but also with the pressure of the society, uh, that especially in the countryside or in little towns, um, uh, women are regarded as terrible mothers 
if they are going back to work and the kids are staying at home or if they are taking, even if they are taking the services of care that is offered. So in some areas you, you just have the care, but it's only when it's offered a couple of children who are going to school or are taking, uh, uh, who are really uh, taking the opportunity to, to, to use the care offers because the social pressure in the background from the people who are living in the surrounding, from the family, from whomever, is so big that one can't let the child uh, go to school and take uh, option of those uh, uh, possibilities. And then it's, then it's normally, and then it's, it's the women. And this is something I was told by really um, uh, 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 quite a bunch of uh, directors of schools who said, it's really the women who are suffering and the, uh, the mothers who are suffering under this situation. So this is not figures I can offer. This is uh, the political situation and landscape. So the experiences that have been transported to me. Thank you very much. And so I, uh, we have one last question and then I'm going to throw in a question of my own. Uh, I know you've been very generous with your time, so we won't press upon it. Um, Neve Fallon has asked, what particular challenges would you anticipate the EU's green and digital um, transitions posing for gender equality? And my mm -hmm. question to you is, what can women expect for the Convention on the Future of Europe? Ah, Besides wow, words. nice. What, yes, Besides yes, words. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for these questions. Um, concerning, um, uh, in, um, it remains a huge priority for Ursula von der Leyen. Of course, we have to, to be careful with our economies. Uh, Europe has to be strong. We want to be strong. Uh, then we also can, uh, a strong economic Europe can also better defend its core values, uh, rule of law and equality of men and women and uh, uh, of every member of the society. Um, the ecologic and the digital challenge are those uh, big goals that remain. And here I would like to uh, draw your attention on artificial intelligence. We know uh, AI um, requires that we're looking very careful at, uh, at men and women. Uh, because what we see right now, if we're not taking care from the beginning on of the developing of, uh, of all those uh, systems, I mean, some of them already existing, uh, women are really uh, treated badly. There are so many stereotypes also in the system. So a computer that is learning, we, we, we just learn all that and there are so many things. So for example, uh, when you go, uh, when you go to uh, a web, when I go to a website, my name is Evelyn Regner. So somehow, and I'm I'm in Facebook. Then I just have on the uh, on the side, it, it's uh, uh, all these uh, uh, advertisements and so on. And it's not only the beauty saloons and whatever that are offering something, but sometimes you have also job offers and uh, uh, and so on. And we compared that and uh, realized with uh, specialists. If my name was not Evelyn, but if my name was, I don't know, uh, Frank, other offers are popping up. So somehow computers are learning. Computers are learning. Of course, they are neutral. Of course, the whole uh, artificial intelligence from the starting point is neutral, but the world is not neutral. And why? Because the world is not neutral. All these inequalities are enshrined and overtaken from the very uh, small technical details to the very big things. Or I'll just give you another, and, and if there are job offers for, a, I, I, I exaggerate right now, running an enterprise, a popping up for a man and for a woman to be the cleaning woman there, this is really something different. And we even don't know that because it's always personalized. Or to give you another small example, and these are really very small examples, but they are blowing up the whole system and making huge differences uh, concerning who is running the world in which way and that has uh, to be taken for the whole conception of uh, artificial intelligence uh, as well. When I'm going to a website of a bank, for example, and I just have to uh, have my account and, and going through the whole thing, it's always popping up first, Mr. And I have to click it away to come to the Miss. So somehow a woman already has for this very simple thing, 
like going and having a look on her bank account, one click more because I have to click the man away and to come to the miss. And this is really a super small, not important detail. And when you just look at the whole system, we have to be very aware and it's already happening. We know that it's already happening that it's not only not gender neutral what is uh, going on in the system, is also looking if you're brown or if you're white, if you're elder, if you're younger. So somehow uh, that inequalities are not enshrined. And this is uh, and, 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 and this is also a huge challenge. The next one is uh, on women in this whole, um, we do a report on that. So somehow we work on that. Women in the digital uh, services, women in the uh, uh, women researchers, women professionals, and all these inequalities that have to be taken on board. So this will be, and this is already an important part of our whole work. And uh, so we are aware of that, but uh, uh, there's really a long way to go. So we need the technicians, we need, uh, the, um, we need those being aware. I mean, I, I would like to have more sociologists and psychologists also in politics and in the whole uh, legislation in order to do the proper screening on, uh, on what, what is going on. And concerning um, uh, uh, the ecologic uh, path we have to go, climate change, I just also give one example. We are working on that simply to, to tell you, yes, it is enshrined in the work, not only of my committee, but in the gender mainstreaming network, that it's happening in all sectors. We are saying what means climate change, simply to give one example, for the public transport who is taking the tram and who is taking the car who is uh, taking more uh, the who is willing to in to go on more for the public means also in the future the trains and so on and who not and then of course you know what the result is who is uh, how the situation is right now that we have to and we are doing that the uh, to to take the gender perspective in all these areas on, uh, uh, on board as well, and that men and women are learning from each other and participating in the same way. And I just can tell you in this regard, who is running, who is looking in a household, for example, uh, when men and women are uh, living together, um, that one should maybe not, uh, that one should put on the uh, solar energy and be more aware. We know from the, from the data we have so far, Women are the one in the household who are doing that, so uh, or more doing that more. So of course we have to take this perspective as well in the whole future on how how we could improve and do our part for the climate change. So as an answer, yes, we are aware of that, but it has to be done exactly in all those areas. And I just tell you, I'm 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 I'm, I'm writing and in close contact. Uh, also with Commissioner Hans, for example, who is responsible for the for the for the budget for the European Union's budget, that the principle of mainstreaming is applied, and this is good for the climate uh, for the fight against the climate change, and this is good for the uh, for the for the digital work, and so that this has to be introduced everywhere. So somehow it's a bit complicated, but um, the crucial thing is member states have to apply it as well. So the commission is doing better and better, but member states have to do that as well. And concerning the future of Europe, I would like that the debate starts soon. We asked already, is that right now postponed? Yes or no? And um, what can I say? The 20, I'm, I'm, I'm always an optimistic uh, uh, person, even right now when we're in uh, the COVID crisis and with all this uh, mess, the 21st century, is the century of women. I'm convinced of that. And I think it's not bad for, for men, just on the contrary. Uh, Work-life balance is one of the key words. Work-life balance is something that not only women want, that also men want. For a four hours week, we should work on that. We are right now thinking how could we, uh, how could everybody bring everything under one hat? it's more sharing. And this is not only um, uh, positive music of the future, this is something where we have to go, to go with the digital re revolution and the productivity of the society and on the other side, so many unemployed of the others. It's a share, a share of working time 
and a share of leisure, a share of work and of life. And I'm convinced that exactly this issue will be a huge issue also for the debate of the future of Europe, because we're debating already on the minimum wage and uh, more and more with this COVID crisis, also the topic of the unconditional uh, 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 income is coming up. So these are issues for the debate of the future of Europe. Well, thank you very, very much. And it only remains for me to, to wish you all the very best in your work on our behalf. And uh, what you do, it's very much appreciated, I think, all over Europe. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much. Uh, I really I like that very, very much to have this exchange with you. Uh, I hope to see you soon. <laughs> so uh, thanks a lot and have a good uh, weekend of Whitsun.